We've been looking forward to this all day. When I hear the name Libby Trickett, I instantly think of that smile, that great smile on the face of one of our golden girls of the pool. But Libby was more than a bubbly personality. She was one of the greats. You don't win four Olympic gold medals, hold two world records and take home a bucket load of silvers and bronze medals as well without being a world-class super swimmer. But what we didn't know when Libby was thrilling an entire nation was that she was struggling with mental health issues, issues which would reach a climax as she tried to get on with her life away from the spotlight and the swimming pool. Libby Trickett joins us from our Brisbane studio. Libby, thank you very much for your time. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I want to congratulate you on the start on your courage. I, th I think it's fabulous to write a book like this because I think you'll help a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I don't know, when I first kind of started thinking about potentially writing a book, um, I wanted it to be really honest and uh, that's something that I hope comes across in the book, I guess. And, you know, it's kind of a warts and all um, look at not only uh, my sporting career and I guess the experiences that I had there, um, up and down as they were, uh, but also, you know, transitioning into the real world and transitioning into motherhood, um, into the workplace. It's, uh, yeah, I hope people can connect with different parts of the book and, I, I, and sort I want to of grab a couple of those parts. different I want elements to, I, of it. I want to go back to the start, if I may, Libby, and talk about the fact that you actually went to your first Olympic Games not really thinking or planning to do so. It was other people who had your schedule and your plan and your participation at the first Olympic Games on their schedule, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I when I first started swimming, I kind of never... It wasn't necessarily about going to the Olympics. I just loved what I was doing. I just absolutely fell in love with swimming. I fell in love with competing. Um, it took me a really long time to actually learn to love the training and understand that if I trained really hard, that made me even faster in the racing pool. But as soon as I made that connection, that was it for me. And it sort of slowly dawned on me, probably between the ages of 15 and 17, that potentially I could go to an Olympic Games or be on the Australian swimming team. Tell me, what... What we were watching was a really bubbly personality, a great smile, as I mentioned in the introduction to our interview, but behind the scenes, you were really hard on yourself, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I Well, it's one of those things. I, I wonder whether that part of my personality actually was a really important element of why I was able to achieve what I ended up achieving in the pool. Um, I was incredibly critical of myself. I was my own worst enemy in that respect and I was constantly expecting more. And I think having that sort of personality trait does actually lend itself quite well to that elite level um, performance. But it's, it can, obviously that can, it has a flip side and it can be incredibly detrimental to your experience of performing at the highest level. I know that, uh, you know, the Hunter Freestyle in Beijing, I mean, I, I came second, I got the silver medal um, that day, but... And you've never for seen me, that, that was race probably back, one have of my you? Most I haven't. I haven't watched the race. It was my worst executed race of my entire swimming career and it was probably one of the most disappointing moments of my swimming career. And a lot of people would look at that and go, you're crazy, you just won a silver medal at the Olympic Games, you're literally second in the world on the world stage. And uh, But for me that was probably one of the most heartbreaking moments of my swimming career. Now on reflection, obviously... Uh, with time and uh, and reflecting and, and looking back, I can understand that that was an exceptional performance um, and an exceptional result, all things considered. But, yeah, at the time it was really devastating. You um, you were quite open about postnatal depression. Um, with postnatal depression, Libby, how, how long does that last? How, how long do you, do you really feel down? Well, I mean, everyone's experience of mental illness in general it can be very different and, and varied um, depending on the situation and, and what people are going through at the time. For me, it was a real process, so probably the burden of postnatal depression and the depth of it 
was a slow creep for me, probably between around four months, like four months post-birth to around eight or nine months was the real dark po- points for me and, and certainly around that eight-month mark particularly. And, and you write in the but book... But then it's a really... And you write in the book, Libby, about how bad it got because you were yelling mm. at the new baby and you knew yeah. you were having a nervous breakdown or something, right? Yeah, it, it felt like a nervous break. Uh, it felt like a mental break more than anything. Uh, I, I lost complete control of myself while I was driving a car and I had no memory of driving from my home to to the gym. I was trying to act, I was trying to take care of myself. I was trying to do all the things that I know do help my mental health by exercising and things like that. But I yeah completely lost um, any sense of control that I had over myself and and my emotions, and was screaming at. Uh, yeah, my eight-month-old daughter, Poppy, um, for about 25 minutes and had no memory of actually driving from home to to the gym. And I think that was the re- point that I realised and recognised that that wasn't a normal way to be feeling and a normal reaction to the situation and that I really needed to seek help. But for me, it, it was a process from there, you know. That was the first step to asking for help and to go see my GP to book in with my psychologist, to talk to my husband more in depth about the help that I needed. But it was a slow process and probably took me, I would say, a good 12 months to really heal. And then probably it took until I had my second daughter and she was a much better sleeper, which was one of the causes of of my postnatal depression in the first place. And she has healed me in in a way that I realised that Poppy just wasn't a sleeper and some babies are sleepers and some babies aren't and it wasn't actually anything that I did or did wrong or um, contributed to that fact. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a long process. Uh, t- tell me, what, when you say it's been a long process, do you still have to, to see anybody about it or, or, is, it, or is, it, is it now, you know, you're completely depression-free? No, I think with mental illness, it, it, you need to make sure you're being proactive at all times. And, and that's whether you have actually experienced depression or anxiety or, you know, drug and alcohol addiction or whatever it looks like in your world. Um, if you haven't actually experienced it, I mean, that's amazing, but it's always important and I think really pertinent that people learn signs and symptoms of mental illness, um, particularly if you may be in that support role as well. Um, but for me, it, I have to be proactive. You know, I am uh, 33 weeks pregnant with my third baby now, so <laughs> I'm very aware that sleep deprivation is a trigger for me in terms of um, uh, being detrimental to my mental health. So there are things that I'm going to put into place to ensure that I'm getting an, as much rest as I possibly can, that I'm getting time to myself to do the things like exercise, um, as much as I can, and obviously eating good food and drinking lots of water also helps. Yeah. But there, there are things that we can all put into place that make sure that we are being proactive rather than reactive in, um, in terms of mental health. Good stuff. I, I, there's a passage in the book that people have got to read when they just don't miss this passage about your wedding day and how you signed up with a magazine mm-hmm. and how they controlled everything you did, including the fact that you really don't have any photographs left and you couldn't see the great view where you were situated. You wanted an outdoor wedding. They wanted to bring it indoor yeah. because there were paparazzi, there were heli... It's a, a most draining part of the book, but it's a part of the book that everyone should read. You wouldn't do that again, would you? No. No, I, I wouldn't. And, you know, that's time, that's uh, maturity, that's um, being able to say no. You know, at, at the age of 22, I didn't have that capacity, but at 34, I certainly have my boundaries and I understand what's important to me. And that's, you know, that's extending to not just perhaps, you know, selling the story to, to a, a magazine, but who I invited. <laughs> we invited way too many people, half of the list I probably can't even remember now. And But that's uh, I don't know, I, for me, my experience was that's what I felt like I should do to make everybody happy and I'm realising now with age and time and wisdom um, and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit ugly around the edges now, so I'm, I'm more than willing to say no and 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 uh, understand my needs um, as well as other people's yeah, and, I'm, and I'm mostly people a, respect a that as well. I'm having a birthday, I've invited 
250 people. I'm not sure I know a lot of them, but <laughs> they're all coming. So I know exactly what you're saying. But it makes exactly. you happy, though. That's great. <laughs> It's, it's, it's great to hear you're happy. What, what are you actually doing now? People will want to know what you're doing. You did some radio recently, uh, Triple M in Brisbane, and then you got out of that, and now what are you doing? Yes, well, the next few weeks are sort of uh, doing, doing book stuff, um, which is really exciting. It's, it's crazy. It's been two years in, in the process, I yeah. guess, to, to get to this point now that it's actually out and on shelves, which is really exciting. And then in six weeks I have a, my third baby, as I mentioned. That's enough. So it'll be a little bit... <laughs> yes, I think it'll be a little bit of the baby bubble time for the Good. next few months, well, but yeah, looking I, forward to, you, to doing some stuff next year. You are a star, Libby Trickett. Yeah. You really are. I think um, Australia is very lucky to have you. Thank you, Libby. Thank you very much for your time. All the very best with Baby 3. You're very kind. Thank you so much for having me. Good on you. Libby Trickett, uh, Beneath the Surface. It's a really good read. She's done well.